Hi, uh, good evening everyone. So this week we are going to take a bit of a detour from our weekly lectures on drugs in dermatology and I thought it, bit, it will be a good idea to discuss pruritus before we go forward. The reason for that is that for the past two weeks we have been discussing the role of antihistamines in dermatology and uh, we kind of regard that whenever a patient comes to us with itching and it is one of the most it, in my opinion it is the most important complaint that a patient uh, has when consulting a dermatologist is that they have itch and we consider all the itch as mediated by only histamine and we start with antihistamines namely the drugs that we have studied in the last two weeks we have the first and the second generation antihistamines but we have to realize that histamine is not the only mediator. If you go back and look at these two videos uh, before, before this particular video, the video where we talk about the different kind of antihistamines in dermatology, I have said that histamine is one of the most, it is the most important mediator to control the itch pathway. But it's not the only mediator. We have a lot, many mediators uh, through which the, the uh, response of scratching to itching or the pathology of itching or pruritus takes place and for us to be in a better position to treat that common complaint of itching in our patients we must first know the pathway through which itch actually relates relays to the uh, skin sorry relays from the skin to the brain so we should know the track or we should know the road through which that stimulus when we perceive something through our skin gets transmitted through the sensory nerves through the spinal cord to the thalamus and the supracortical or subcortical regions of the brain and we have a response of scratching to itch so it becomes very important that we have a good understanding of the pathomechanism of pruritus or the general neurophysiology of pruritus so I thought that we'll take a uh, kind of a different track this week and we'll discuss the pathophysiology of pruritus or pathophysiology of itching. Now this video was getting a bit longer, uh, longer than my usual videos. And I thought that in, uh, for, for, it, for me to able to convey that message properly to the viewers is to divide this video into two parts. So part one will deal with the pathophysiology of pruritus that means the normal physiology the normal sequence of events that happens through which signals from the skin goes to the brain and in part two of the video we will discuss about various clinical aspects of pruritus and we will discuss disorders like senile pruritus or uremic pruritus or uh, you could say uh, biliary stasis pruritus and all sorts of different kind of pruritus and itch disorders and the focus will be more on the non-histamine mediated itching so that we know that which particular pathway or which particular itch mediator is working in our patient and then we can treat. For example, if a patient has neuropathic itch or any itching because there is damage to the nerves, we might consider not using histamines, maybe other uh, blockers to control the itch. There have been an ongoing debate that whether we should use antihistamines in atopic dermatitis and the reason for that debate is that in atopic dermatitis we have a lot more things happening apart from histamine. So uh, there, there is little logic, there is very little logic in using antihistamine in atopic dermatitis. We still use it but we should know when to switch over from the histamine class of drugs to other non-histaminergic class of drugs. And before we go and discuss the non-histaminergic classes of drugs to control itching, it's a good idea to, dis to know about the pathway of itching. So with this video, the part 1 video, we'll discuss how uh, the sensation of itch travels from skin to brain. Okay, And uh, after this video, I think you'll have a good understanding of this pathway. And it's a very important pathway to know because uh, it is a very important question that you might get in your exam. And trust me, after you have listened to both of these videos, part 1 and part 2, you can write pages and pages about physiology of pruritus. And many of the concepts would be clearer why in some patients your antihistamines don't work or why the control of itching is not that good. So without any further ado, 
from uh, this week we'll start discussion on pathophysiology of pruritus okay so this is a small diagram that i have taken from the this article all the articles that i mentioned in my video the url would be there in the description just copy paste it go and try to access the full text and read these are all very good articles you will learn a lot especially this article on uh, physiology rev general the path physiology and pathophysiology of itching so the sensation of it starts from the skin and from the skin you can see this nerve endings this nerve endings are at the level of dermo epidermal junction okay and these nerve endings then divide a lot and then interdigitate or go in within the separate keratinocytes so if you can see if i can just change my pen color so in between these cells you can see this nerve endings going and these are known as free nerve endings okay so whenever you have a part of cutaneous sensory nerves going to the skin and supplying the areas and tissues the free nerve endings go within the keratinocytes and that is why it is able to judge all the sensation of itching the only layer of epidermis which does not have that free nerve endings is stratum corneum okay so stratum corneum or the topmost layer of the epidermis doesn't have contact with the free nerve endings but all the other layers of the epidermis does have some soft form of contact with free nerve endings okay now let's start with itch now pruritus or itch now remember that you have words like pruritus and you have pruritus so what's the difference uh, it's a simple concept to understand you can use these two words interchangeably but itis means inflammation okay like dermatitis cholecystitis okay so itis means inflammation so when we see pruritus it means that something inflammatory is going while pruritus has a lot of other mechanism also inflammation does cause itch it's a very important pathway of causing itch but there are other neuropathic neurologic pathways psychogenic pathways uh, centrally acting pathways which can also cause itch and they are not entirely dependent on inflammation so pruritus is a better word to use rather than pruritus and both of these uh, in general uh, general uh, conversation can be used interchangeably but what they mean is itch so itch has been said as the least understood and studied somatosensory modality it's very the it the sensation of itch is very vague and it has been very uh, it has been studied in detail but still we know very little about how, how does itch actually act okay so the definition of itch is it's an unpleasant sensation which leads to urge to scratch okay so sensation becomes a stimulus and urge to scratch becomes a response so itching is an unpleasant sensation that leads to urge to scratch it's a benign physiological response but it severely affects quality of life that's why it's very important to study the uh, mechanism of itching it involves cross talk between sensory nerves keratinocytes immune systems at, at the level of skin okay so at the level of skin there is a good amount of interplay between sensory nerves keratinocytes and immune system and after the skin the the mechanism goes through the sensory nerves to the spinal cord and then to the cortex so sequentially in this video we are going to learn a bit about all the steps of the pathway and we'll learn them in quite a big uh, big detail so that if any question comes from any particular aspect of that pathology that mechanism we are able to write about it or at least answer in vivas so we have to target the main mediator as i said histamine is the most important mediator but we have all other mediators also we need to target the main mediator if we want to control itching okay so for that we must know how do different kind of chemicals act for uh, for uh, in, for eliciting a response of or a stimulus of itch we we'll start first with the sensory nerves 
So as I have said that the end branches of cutaneous sensory nerves go forward and they divide a lot and interdigitate between the keratinocytes. Okay, apart from stratum corneum, all layers of the epidermis has this has access to this free nerve endings. Okay. Now these sensory nerve endings or the free nerve endings are also known as pruriceptors. It's a it's an it's an amalgamation of pruritus and receptors. So the free nerve endings are known as pruriceptors. The pathway starts from the stimulus, anything which causes the sensation of itch, then the different chemical mediators. These mediators then act on their respective receptors, and a signal has signal is then generated through a receptor. And through peripheral pathways, that means the peripheral cutaneous nerves, the sensation or the signal goes to central processing. Central processing happens at the level of brain, at the level of CNS. Okay, and after uh, the processing of the itch stimulus, it goes into central interpretation, which also happens at the level of brain. Now, central processing can happen at the level of spinal cord, but the majority of processing, uh, the majority of processing, uh, procession of the itch stimulus happens at the level of brain, and then the signal is interpreted and then converted into a motor response of scratching. Okay. Now, let's. We have studied about. Uh, we have studied very briefly about the cutaneous nerves. We will study them in detail. Don't worry. So let's come to the stimulus. Now, a stimulus for itching is known as pruritogen. Gen means generating, and prurito comes from pruritus. Okay, so anything that generates pruritus is pruritogen. So this is this is a term which is used for stimulus, and these stimulus are induced in the skin, and then it leads to sensation of itch, and then an urge to scratch. Okay. So anything which lands on the skin or attacks the skin or damages the skin and then leads to the cascade of pathway that leads to us scratching the area is known as pruritogen. Now remember, uh, uh, for many years we know that pain and itching has a good connected, uh, you could say a good relationship. Okay. But there are differences in these two sensations. So whenever whenever human beings feel pain, the reflex action is to withdraw the limb. Okay, whenever you touch a uh, tip of a needle or a pointed end of something, your reflex action is to withdraw your hand. Clear? The itch uh, stimulus is a bit different. Whenever you feel itch, you will not withdraw your hand, but the other hand comes and scratches the area. Okay. So in one response, you are withdrawing the organ. And in the other response, you are actually utilizing other organs and just looking at it. The reason, the reason for that is that it has an evolutionary benefit. And what do we mean by that? That means through the evolution, let's say, uh, let's say in uh, in the times when the human beings were just evolving and uh, we had a lot of fur or a lot of hair on our body. And just to take care of any kind of arthropods or insects that might have climbed into the fur and caused itching, we used to scratch so that we can remove any agent which is causing us an unpleasant sensation. So itching was, uh, itching is, itching is, was, and is a good evolutionary response which is to protect us from all the agents which we should not come into contact with. Okay, so that is, and pain is the same thing. Pain also protects us from all the things which, which we, we should not touch. Okay, that is why pain and itch have a tendency to be related. So, so sequentially in the video, you will realize that uh, many receptors for pain and many receptors of itch overlap. In fact, the nerve that carries the signal for both of these sensations has found to have a significant amount of overlap. Same nerve can carry pain and itch depending on what our receptors are excited or what, what is the threshold of that stimulus. So, uh, so subsequently in the, in the two videos, we'll be discussing the relationship of pain and itch. Now, for any agent to cause itch, it has to be a weak stimulus but a long-acting one. What do we mean by that? 
if it's a strong stimulus and it acts only for a very brief amount of time it might lead to excitation of pain receptors and then it becomes nociceptive 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 means that anything which causes pain okay so if you have a strong stimulus for a short duration it causes pain if you have a weak stimulus for long long uh, duration it will cause an itch stimulus now its stimulus has latency what do you mean by latency that means it takes some time before the agent lands on the skin till the signal of itching is generated okay for example pain is somewhat instantaneous okay the moment you touch a needle you withdraw your hand but for itch to act it ha it has to be it has to stay on there for some time and it is roughly in seconds roughly about 10 seconds or so okay now coming to histamine, histamine as I said, histamine as I said is the first and the most important pruritogen. If you want to know more about histamine in detail, go and see the video on first generation antihistamines, H1 antihistamine, in which we discuss what is histamine and what is the role of histamine in dermatology. So histamine is the first and the most important pruritogen. When histamine is in injected intradermally, it leads to itching. And when it is injected intravenously, it leads to flushing. Okay, flushing means increase in redness, increase in blood vessel permeability, so there's swelling. Now, it, a, a very important question to ask is, let's say when you inject histamine, let's say you're doing an autologous serum testing for autoimmune urticaria and you use histamine as a positive control. Whenever you inject histamine, you have a wheel. Okay, if all itching is mediated by histamine, why do we have itching in different disorders but no wheel formation? We have wheel formation only in urticaria to some extent angioedema. But let's say in atopic dermatitis, we have itch, but you don't have wheel. So an agent, a chemical, which is causing itching and wheel does not cause wheel in different kind of disorders. So that means a lot other mediators are also playing their role in itching, not only histamine. Okay, so a gradient might be required. That means that if you are using a very slow rate of infusion of histamine, the flushing is not that severe. Okay, but if you use a sudden bolus of histamine, yes, you will have significant flushing. Okay, inactivation means if you have a nerve ending, let's say this is a nerve ending and a lot of histamine is now is present around it, slowly and slowly the response of this nerve ending will decrease a negative inhibition happens that means prolonged exposure to histamine can lead to inactivation of those receptors that's what we mean and there are multiple agents known as histamine releasers so what happens is again let's say this is the nerve free nerve ending one action can be because of histamine directly acting on it one action could be because of histamine which is released by another agent you have another agent which releases or leads to release of histamine and then this histamine acts on the histamine receptors. So these agents are known as histamine releasers and they can also cause itching which is histamine mediated. Okay, so you can have agents which separately causing itching, you can have histamine separately causing itching and you can have agents that release histamine and then cause itching because of that. Okay, so three types of agents you can consider. Let's discuss where in uh, one slide what do we mean by histamine, okay? So histamine is one of the most important mediators of itch. The latent period is roughly about 10 to 50 seconds. That means 10 to 50 seconds should be uh, uh, available for histamine to act on the receptors so that the signal for itching is generated. It is majorly stored as granules uh, inside the mast cells, a lot more in quantity as compared to epidermal cells. That means some keratinocytes have also found to have granules containing histamine. So they can also act as source of histamine, but the major source is through mast cells. Okay. Now uh, in the histamine video or the video on antihistamine drugs, we have learned that there are four types of histamine receptors. You have H1, 2, 3 and 4. For H, H1 is the major receptor and the other minor receptor is H4. So major and minor is just depending on the potential uh, of the receptors to cause itch. It has nothing to do with number or, or uh, efficacy or uh, propensity and all that. Okay. So H1 is situated on sensory nerves and endothelia of the blood vessels. 
H4 is situated on Th2 cells, mast cells, fibroblasts, keratinocytes, hematopoietic cells. Remember that histamine also increases hematopoiesis. That is through H4 receptor. Now action on various inflammatory cells like Th2 cells, mast cells and other even eosinophils have H4 receptors and that leads to increase of multiple inflammatory cytokines. One of this is interleukin-31 and interleukin-31 has been said to be a pruritogenic cytokine. Pruritogenic cytokine and the major disorder in which we study interleukin-31 is atopic dermatitis. So the itch is a lot mediated for uh, through interleukin-31 in, in, in atopic dermatitis especially the itch of the chronic variety is mediated through interleukin-31. So uh, biologicals which act against interleukin-31 show a very significant reduction in atopic dermatitis induced uh, related itching. The H4 receptors are found on C fibers. We will discuss what are those C fibers in a few in a few minutes. Receptors on keratinocytes and dorsal spinal ganglia. We will discuss each of these areas in subsequent slides. Don't worry. Okay. One more thing about interleukin 31 is that the levels are proportional to itch. That means higher the levels, more the itch. Okay. So it's proportional to itching. In atopic dermatitis, it has been found to be raised in serum in patients who have complaints of more itch. Now these are the other mediators namely endopeptidase substance P. This is very important secondary mediator of itching. Acetylcholine, bradykinin, calicrine, neurotrophin 4, CGRP, plasmin, cathepsin, complement proteins, papain, trypsin. Now cowhage. Cowhage is one of the first studied agent that used to cause itch. Scientific name is Musuna pruriens. The prurians name is inside the scientific name and what happens is cowhage is a plant which has a lot of spicules like this and it has a lot of spicules and these spicules have cathepsin. I don't remember the full name. I think cathepsin B or cathepsin C. Okay. Now these spicules when they come into contact inside the skin that means when they when the plant pricks you it leads to release of histamine and Initially, it was thought that histamine mediated itch is the reason for the itch that we feel because of cow hage exposure. Okay. But nowadays, the newer studies say that the cow hage itch also acts through non histaminergic pathway too. Okay. So, that is just one, uh, one tidbit about cow hage exposure. Other mediators also include vasoactive inhibitory peptide. So, so let's go forward and discuss each, uh, discuss one or two major ones in detail. So uh, remember, you can take a screenshot uh, of this area. So these are all the other mediators apart from histamine that causes itch. Now let's discuss the receptors. So we have discussed the mediators. Now coming to the receptors on which the mediators attach and start the generation signaling of itch. Okay, apart from histamine, when, apart from H1 receptor, which is the first, histamine 1 receptor, the second most important receptor is TRPV1. TRPV st uh, stands for Transient Receptor Potential Vanilloid Ion Channel 1. Okay, and they are very important receptors. I mean, two years back in, I think, 2021, Nobel Prize in Medicine was given to persons who were working on TRPV1 receptors for temperature uh, and uh, other sensation, hot and cold sensation, while the Ig Nobel Prize, just in the comment section, let me know who all know about the prize known as Ig Nobel. So Ig Nobel was given to a person, uh, a dermatologist, I think, three, four years back, who received Ig Nobel for the work that itching leads to pleasure. That is the video, oh sorry, that is the study that won the Ig Nobel Prize around three to four years back. So let's come back to the video. The receptor that we were discussing is TRPV1. It's a capsaicin receptor. Capsaicin is one of the major constituents of chilies. And it is the same chemical which leads to the burning sensation in our tongues when we uh, eat anything which has a lot of chili. So, this, the, so TRPV1 is a type of capsaicin receptor. That means it recognizes capsaicin. And it's one of the major receptors apart from histamine receptor which is responsible for itching. 
Now let's track down a bit and learn about the nerve fibers. There are two major sensory nerve fibers. You have A delta and C fibers. Okay, out, out of this, this unmyelinated C fibers are the important one as they major, majorly carry itch and dull pain. Remember again, there is a good relationship between pain and itch. Okay. So, uh, C delta C fibers or the unmyelinated C fibers are the fibers that we will talk about when we are talking about the sensory uh, pathway of our itch. So, the free uh, sensory nerve endings of unmyelinated C fibers has a lot of TRPV1 receptors. Okay. Only 5% of these fibers carry only itch. Remember, as I said, that pain and itch has good relationship. The uh, single fiber which carries the pain sensation can also carry its sensation depending on the threshold of activation. But 5% of those fibers carry only its sensation, not a pain sensation. There are also mechanosensitive fibers which are known as CMI. Okay, C fibers, mechanosensitive. So, mechanosensitive fibers are known as CMI fibers. And these CMI fibers are particularly rich in TRPV1 receptors. And they are responsible for histamine sensitive itching. And these receptors predominantly are attached to keratinocytes, dendritic cells and mast cells. Remember I said that in the upper layer of layers of, or, or in all the layers of epidermis apart from stratum corneum, you have free nerve and uh, you have free nerve endings interdigitating inside the keratinocytes. So majority of the free nerve endings that are within the keratinocytes, in between the keratinocytes, have the receptors of transient uh, TRPV1 receptors. Now these are these are also present on mechanical sensitive and magnetic C fibers. That means when we have a very light touch on the skin, it might lead to itching because of these free nerve endings. Okay. Other receptors which is TRPV4 that is also responsible for histamine mediated itching. Histamine mediated itching. Now, one more TR receptors is TRPM8. M stands for melastatin. Okay. So, T TRPM8, like all the receptors, let's say TRPV1 is capsaicin receptors. That means it takes the sensation of heat and pain. TRPM8 takes the sensation of cold instead of heat. It takes the cool, cooling sensation. Cooling sensation and the sensation of action of menthol. And it leads to relief in itch so whenever we apply something cool let's say ice or any menthol containing ointment or menthol containing uh, talcum powders the itch is somewhat relieved and the action has been said to be through trpm8 receptor okay so these are th this slide is uh, explaining about trpv1 receptors let's move forward Second receptor that we will talk about is H4 histamine receptors. I am not talking about H1 receptors. We have talked about that in detail in the, in the video on antihistamines, first generation antihistamines. We will talk about H4. So as I have said that H1 and H4 are the two major receptors which are responsible for H. H4 is present on mast cells, on eosinophils and is responsible for allergic inflammation or itching that we see in allergic disorders. Let's say atopic dermatitis or any other... Uh, you any other inflammation based itching disorders now uh, it the h1 receptor blockers h4 sorry h4 receptor blockers blocking the h4 receptors is found to be uh, helpful in many different cases of itching which do not respond to h1 antihistamine so let me rephrase that you have two receptors h1 and h4 h1 is the major receptor for itching h4 also carries the itching uh, itching sensation and many times when your patients don't respond to h1 antihistamine it can respond to h4 receptor blockage because H4 receptor is responsible for substance P induced itch. Remember the slide on other mediators of itching when we discuss about substance P that it is the next common, next important mediator after histamine. So since H4 receptor can act, uh, act through substance P, blocking the H4 receptor leads to good amount of itching relief in antihistamine resistant cases. Now this is the drug, the, the tentative name for the drug is JNJ777120, the clinical trials are undergoing and soon it will be 
clinical trials for anti itching medication the trials for anti gastric acid secretion is already done the trial on anti itch is undergoing this is the code name for that drug maybe in coming few years we can have h4 receptors as another agent to reduce itching the third receptor that we'll discuss is par what is par par is protease activated receptors and these are special type of receptors which which are activated by the trpv1 which are which activates trpv1 now what happens is that you have par okay mast cells apart from containing histamine has other mediators also for example tryptase now mast cell has tryptase and whenever mast cells are activated or degranulated they will release multiple mediators and what happens is that tryptase when released will attach itself to par receptor par will then release substance p again substance p the second most important mediator in itching this substance p will attach to neurokinin receptor 1 now neurokinin receptor 1 is the is the receptor for substance p we have already told in the last slide that it also acts through h4 receptors but the major receptor for substance p is neurokinin receptor 1 okay and through neurokinin receptor 1 it leads to generation of the h signal so that's how the par receptors work now par receptors are up regulated in disorders like atopic dermatitis and that is why we say that the itch in dermatitis is not mediated particularly through histamine so anti histamines don't have a good value in atopic dermatitis as compared to other disorders in which they work very well now par are g protein coupled receptors they it also activates trpv1 so again a histaminergic itch can be mediated through trpv1 at this i have already discussed that during inflammation mast cell derived tryptase activates par2 on neurons and this neuron are going to secrete sp which acts on neurokinin 1 receptor and this leads to itching okay other receptors that activate par are calicrin calicrin cathepsin s cowhage again dust mite cockroaches and all those insect uh insect proteins that when when uh, we suspect any itching through dust mites and cockroaches the par is the major receptor which gets activated okay now uh let's move forward uh okay mm -hmm. the fourth receptor is neurokinin receptors again i told this this is the receptor for substance p this is the receptor for substance p neurokinin receptors also known as tachykinin receptors it they are the receptor for substance p and high levels of these receptors or the mediator substance p has been found in chronic spontaneous urticaria so whenever you have a patient of chronic spontaneous urticaria not responding to antihistamine you can very well make a guess that other mediate, mediators most probably predominantly substance p might be at play okay so if it is acting on central nervous system substance p will act through neurokinin receptor 1 okay and if it substance p is acting on peripheral nerves it will act through mrgprs receptor i'll discuss the full form of uh, mrgprs in subsequent slides don't worry so peripherally it acts on mrgprs uh, receptor while in centrally it acts on neurokinin receptor 1 okay so neurokinin group of receptors you have a lot of receptors i think there are four receptors 1 2 3 and 4 receptors 1 to 3 are present in keratinocytes endothelium mast cells and spinal dorsal hall neurons okay and neurokinin receptor 1 which is present in mast cell leads to degranulation and leads to secretion of substance p so what happens is that you have a mast cell here okay so this is a mast cell let's label this as m okay and it has all the histamine granules so in the video lecture on h1 antihistamine i told you that we have a receptor known as fc epsilon r which is receptor for ige antibodies another receptor 
is known as NK neurokinin receptor 1. This is also another receptor. And when substance B attaches itself to neurokinin receptor 1, this also leads to degranulation of histamine. And this histamine can act through histaminergic pathway and cause H. So substance P can cause H on its own. Substance P can also lead to secretion of histamines. Okay. And since mast cell also has tryptases, tryptase can also be secreted and tryptase will work more on the PAR receptors which further increases substance P and that is how you develop a cycle in which the itch keeps on in increasing with every stimulation okay so understand we have receptors called neurokinin there are four types of receptors neurokinin 1 is present in mast cell which is responsible for degranulating the mast cells under the action of substance P substance P is the major stimulus for neurokinin receptors okay let's move forward the fifth receptor are opioid receptor. They are very important, especially in itch related to chronic opioid users. They are, they are histamine independent. That means they don't require histamine to cause itch. They are centrally acting. That means the work is at the level of spinal cord and brain. Very stupid and bad diagram. But spinal cord and brain. So they are centrally acting uh, mediators of itch. Okay. When you inject opioids locally, that means just below the skin, the itch and wheel that happens is mediated by histamine. But the action of itch, the major pathway through which opioid receptors act on the skin to cause itch or act on the body to cause itch is not histamine mediated. Okay. You have different types of receptors. I think you have three receptors. Uh, you have the mu, you have the kappa. And you have the delta receptors. Okay, so mu and kappa are majorly mediated, uh, majorly implicated in itch caused by opioid stimulation. Okay, so mu receptors are present on sensory nerve fibers. Kappa receptors are present on keratinocyte, K for kappa, K for keratinocytes, mast cells, fibroblast, and CNS. Okay, activation of central mu receptors induces pruritus. So what happens is that mu leads to itching when these are activated and kappa leads to decrease in itching when this is activated okay so mu opioid receptors when activated will lead to itching kappa opioid receptors will lead to relief of itching when they are activated okay so because of that drugs that stop the mu activation for example you have drugs like uh, drugs like naloxone you have drugs like naltrexone. So these are mu receptor antagonists and uh, through the action of blocking the mu receptor, the relief of H is achieved. Okay. There and subsequently, if you can activate the kappa receptors, you can also decrease itching. Okay. So in kappa receptors, there are mul uh, multiple drugs. I, I have written one name here, so I'll mention it for everybody. It is nalbufrin. Nalbufin. Nalbufin is a kappa agonist. So activating kappa receptor will lead to relief of itching. Activating mu receptor will lead to increase in itching. So you need antagonist at the mu and agonist at the kappa receptor. Clear? So that's what we have to find. Another agent that activates kappa receptor is dynanorphin. Clear? We have discussed here now. So opioid receptors are majorly responsible for centrally acting H. The centrally acting H works on the level of spinal cord and brain. It is independent of histamine. There are three types of receptors, mu, kappa, delta. Activation of mu receptors leads to itching. Activation of kappa receptors leads to decrease in itching. So mu antagonist will work as anti-H agent and kappa agonist will work as anti-H agents. Clear? If not clear, then we can go back and see again this slide and we'll have a good understanding of opioid induced itching. Now, other receptors are mass related G protein coupled receptors, the MRGPRS that we talked about. We have cannabinoid receptors, we have natriuretic peptide receptors, 
they are majorly located at the level of spinal cord and they are known as first level for receptor for itch circuitry that means the itch circuit that forms starting from the skin through the spinal cord through the brain the first level of receptor for itch circuitry is called as uh, called uh, the term is given to natriuretric peptide receptor it's one of the upcoming new receptors that people are studying a lot and it is responsible and why do we say that it's first level for its circuitry why not the level uh, of free nerve endings at uh, circuitry because at the level of spinal cord you can block the itching the body can easily block the itching at the level of spinal cord or control the amount of signals reaching the brain so the first toll gate or, or the first you know stop or checkpoint a good checkpoint is seen in the level of spinal cord and it's believed to be because of natriuretic peptide receptor that is why they're known as first level of receptor for itch circuitry another important receptor is gastrin releasing peptide and its receptor that means grpr g r p r gastrin releasing peptide receptor this has been found as first itch specific neurotransmitter and is responsible for peripheral to central transmission that means transmission of signals from the peripheral nerves to the brain and it has been found to be the first itch specific neurotransmitter remember that itch and pain has a good relationship okay you have histamine your substance p all of these have other actions apart from itching but it's specific neurotransmitter the first ever which has been termed as the first itch specific neurotransmitter is gastrin raising peptide and their receptor and merkel cells vaccinian corpus cells you know all of these um, muffinis corpus cells they are more as mechanoreceptors so even in even long duration weak stimulus can easily lead to starting of sensation of itch let's move forward now if this is just one uh, image which shows the various receptors which are responsible histamine acting on h1 receptor h4 receptor serotonin on h7r receptor cysteine proteases at mrgprs receptor chloroquine through mrgpr receptor bilirubin same uh, trpa1 receptors trpv1 which we have discussed so all of these receptors are are at the level of uh, you know sensation the nerve neuron receptors and all of these receptors sequentially leads to increase in itch sensation and itch signal and these are the cytokines like interleukin 31 or inflammatory cytokines is like 4 and 13 4 and 13 are implicated in atopic dermatitis 31 is implicated in chronic itching so these are also receptors present here so just this image is just to illustrate the this different receptors for itching now let's come to nerves so we have discussed the mediators we have discussed the receptors on which they act now this receptor will generate a signal and this signal will travel through the nerves okay so this is the pathway so nerves we have a theory known as selectivity and label line theory selectivity means that one nerve will carry the itch and pain pathway so you have itch plus pain but depending on various activation thresholds various receptors that are activated it might carry pain the same nerve can carry itch okay so they are somewhat selective nerve nerve can decide what signal to carry depending on the receptors which are activated while the label line theory says that you have two different type of fibers one fiber will carry itch predominantly the other fiber will carry pain so these all theories are, are going on we have found uh, different itch specific or yeah or it restricted nerve fibers at the level of spinal cord further studies are ongoing okay so the nerves include spinal and cutaneous nerve cutaneous nerves are those nerves arising from the skin spinal are the larger nerve trunks that goes to the dorsal root ganglion or the thoracic level of spinal cord and other important nerves are interneurons interneurons are situated at the level of spinal cord and they are responsible for uh, controlling the amount of signal transduction and acts as a, a good checkpoint in the itch cycle okay so look at this uh, video sorry or look at this image and this image i have taken from this article physiology and pathophysiology of itch and i would request each and every one of you to go and get the full text article and read in detail it's a very good article if you want to understand the depth of the itch cycle and the circuitry of itching go and read that in detail
okay so these are the free okay let me just change the color of the pen so these are the free nerve endings okay so these free nerve endings are in between the keratinocytes and when they detect a signal a stimulus for itching or a pruritogen it leads to signal trans this the stimuli or the chemical will act on the receptor the receptor will lead to development of signal and this signal goes through the different types of neurons so you have histaminergic neurons in which histamine mediated itch is responsibly carried and then you have other neurons which are non histaminergic that means other mediators are being carried okay so these signals will be carried to the spinal cord or the dorsal root ganglion first and in the dorsal root ganglion you have the cell bodies of these individual nerves and from dorsal root ganglion it will go into the superficial laminae of the spinal cord and in the superficial laminae they will cross the spinal cord to the contralateral side they will cross to the other side and then ascend in the spinal cord as the spinothalamic tract so the itch sensation is carried by the contralateral side spinothalamic tract and as the name suggests it goes from the spine to the thalamus in the thalamus the processing happens the centrally processing of the itch sensation happens and then it is transmitted to various cingulate gyrus and the subcortical centers and the motor cortex the motor cortex is responsible for initiating the response of scratching you need to remove your muscles to scratch and the motor cortex is responsible for starting this initiation okay so uh, there are multiple uh, multiple points that we can discuss here at the centrally controlled level but i would request you to go and have this kind of uh, the get access to this full text of this article and read this article it's a very beautifully written article very detailed if you want to learn more about physiology of itching let's move forward so this diagram i've taken from balonia textbook of dermatology fourth edition the fifth chapter page 101 and it's a very simplified diagram of the diagram that we have seen the, on the last slide so you have the itch sensation which is carried by the c fiber which transmits pain also remember that pain and itch goes through same fibers the cell bodies line dorsal root ganglion and then dorsal root ganglion it crosses the spinal cord to the contralateral side and then ascend in the spinothalamic fibers okay now this spinothalamic fiber will also get some fibers from cerebral aqueduct which is responsible for the uh, further central processing of the itch signal and this spinothalamic tract will continue and reach the thalamus and from the thalamus it will reach the cortical areas namely it will reach the anterior cingulate gyrus here it will reach the somatosensory 1 and somatosensory 2 areas and the motor cortex for initiation of uh, the response to it that is the scratching so if you want to know the basic details of this neurophysiology of scratching read this chapter 5 cutaneous neurophysiology from balonia textbook of dermatology my favorite textbook for dermatology now we have discussed about various mediators of which the receptors on which they attach and the cutaneous nerves now we'll discuss about the cortical processing that means what all happens at the level of brain okay so you have brain regions which are common to both pathways what do we mean by both pathways that means histamine and non histaminergic pathway remember in the previous uh, uh, slide that i was showing of the brown diagram one i told i showed you two neurons one was histaminergic other was non histaminergic the both pathways are at the end relate to the same areas the somatosensory cortex 1 and 2 and it is responsible for detection other areas are insular cortex thalamus is there because it is ascending to the spinal thalamic tract and the motor related regions for initiation of scratching so the activation of motor cortex is responsible for initiating scratching other areas like precuneus areas in the brain is responsible for memory and visual spatial processing so what do you mean by that memory means that uh, it goes into your reflex memory that is how the itch scratch cycle starts uh, whenever you scratch it the first time the brain keeps a record that this area always elicits an itch sensation so one has to scratch whenever there is itching what do we mean by visual spatial processing it is responsible for a term known as contagious itching 
contagious itching for example if you see a person scratching even you feel like scratching yourself okay so this precuneous area is responsible for contagious scratching contagious means spreading from person to person and many a times you would have realized that when you're seeing patients of atopic dermatitis one after the other even you would like you would reflexly would like to scratch your leg or scratch your arms or something okay other important area is the striatum and substantia nigra which is responsible for reward processing so what happens is when a sensation of itch travels from skin to brain it travels to striatum and substantia nigra also whenever we scratch the area it leads to good amount of serotonin release serotonin and dopamine when uh, these uh, these mediators are released these are known as happy hormones happy hormones so because of release of these hormones you feel happy you feel good and that is why you keep on scratching and that is why scratching an area which is itching gives you gives you a lot of relief okay and this reward processing center is responsible for giving you that shot of dopamine whenever you scratch an itch okay and that is why itch becomes addictive a person will keep on scratching till the skin is damaged because it leads to a good reward the non histaminergic pathway have a more extensive activation of the cortical area namely the insular cortex claustrum globus pallidus supported body putamen and thalamic nuclei we are not going to go into detail it's much more important for uh, physiologists to know not for dermatologist now negative feedback mechanism what do we mean by negative feedback mechanism there are some mechanism in place which are responsible for decreasing the amount of signals that reach the brain okay so these are negative control mechanisms whenever an area itches a lot the pathway starts to limit the transmission of those signals okay so this include mechanical stimuli pain and cooling that means if you have itch on your hand so if you uh, just put your hand on there the act the action or the signal of touch gets transmitted to the nerves and it kinds of leads to negative feedback on the itch carrying nerves so whenever i see patients who have uh, difficulty in controlling their itch i always recommend that instead of scratching they should just put their hand and not move it so that leads to a negative feedback mechanism and itching is reduced another good idea is cooling you can wet a towel and put on your hand or you can just apply something cooling sensation remember that menthol containing drpm8 receptor so this cooling sensation helps in itching plus application of ice or cold water decreases inflammation so it also helps in inflammation mediated itching other other good receptor or other good negative inhibitory neurons is the bhlhb5 you just have to remember the name these are very important receptor and it is upcoming and very uh, area of interest in itch pathology so the name stands for basic helix loop helix family member b5 and they are positive inhibitory interneurons so remember that in the spinal cord you have uh, the interdigitation of the dorsal root ganglia okay so if i just change the color here is the cell body this neuron part goes to the skin goes to the skin and the other axon is relayed here okay here you have the contralateral spinothalamic tract okay so you also have some negative uh, you could say inhibitory interneurons interneurons that means they will be between two neurons and inhibitory means they their their uh, function is to decrease the amount of signals which are transmitted so they are inhibitory interneurons and bhlhb5 is one of the important interneurons other inhibitory neurotransmitters include glycine dynorphin remember dynorphin acts on the kappa opioid receptor kappa opioid receptor and agonist and then that, that is responsible for you know endorphin or uh, the opioid mediated relief in itching or the opioid receptor mediated relief in itching gaba these are all inhibitory neurotransmitters responsible for decreasing the signal of itch descending inhibitory pathway now descending inhibitory pathway means that from supra spinal areas namely the peri aqueductal gray remember the image that i showed just go back in the video and see the video see the image from balonia 
as I told you that one fiber is coming from periaqueductal gray, that fiber is responsible for keeping track of the amount of signals that are being passed to the brain and to limit those signals. Okay, and they are these are known as descending inhibitory pathway. Why descending inhibitory pathways? Because they go from brain to spinal cord. So normal pathway goes from the spinal to spine to brain, which are known as spinothalamic tract. The descending inhibitory pathway goes from the brain to the spinal cord. They are descending. They inhibit the signal, so inhibitory pathways. And they act by activating the BHLHB5 receptor, which we have already discussed, are the interneurons. Clear? So these four points are very important to understand the negative feedback mechanisms. And whenever you get a question on pathophysiology of itch, it's a good idea to mention one paragraph about negative feedback mechanism. If you just write those four names, even that should be enough for the examiner. Now, uh, with this, we have uh, studied the physiology of itch. We have studied different mediators that cause itch. We have studied different receptors on which they attach. After receptors, we have studied about different nerve fibers that carry them. After nerve fibers, we have discussed the role of spinal cord, dorsal root ganglion and interneurons. After that, we have discussed about spinothalamic tract, thalamus, cortical processing of itching and the descending negative feedbacks or the negative control mechanisms that we see in itch. So if you go through this video, just, just listen to this video, listen to what I'm saying. You will understand that you can, you have now understood the basic physiology of itching and can easily, uh, easily understand whenever we'll discuss the antibiotic agents that at what level they are going to act. So let's say you have a patient who, who has a problem with opioid induced itching. It's a good idea not to give antihistamine but to give new opioid receptor blockers or kappa receptor activators that will help them a lot. So this particular slide, the present slide uh, are different definitions. These are very good viva questions. A lot of questions uh, they have been asked uh, to me when I was a resident. So it's a good idea that I should go through all of these definitions. So allodynia. Dynia means pain. Allo means other, allograft. Remember allograft, so allodynia. That means pain and itch from a non-painful or a non-itchy stimulus. So any stimulus which normally doesn't cause itch or pain, if that starts causing pain, it's allodynia. Allokinesis. Allokinesis means itch from a non-itch stimulus. So remember this word, kinesis. This is not kinesis. There is no I after K. It's kinesis. Kinesis means itch. Okay. So itch from a non-itch stimulus. Hyperkinesis. Hyperkinesis kinesis means intense itch to a mild itchy stimulus. That means any stimulus which normally cause a little itch will cause a lot of itch in hyperkinesis. Atmokinesis. This is very important. Itching on removing clothes or coming in contact with air. Okay, whenever you see a patient of let's say tinea infection or any urtic area or even in even yourself when you come after work, whenever you remove clothes or there's a cooling sensation that happens on air, uh, the itch sometimes increases a lot. That is known as atmokinesis. Okay, and remember if you have an eye in between atmokinesis, that's different. Okay, atmokinesis is control of the weather, which we see in the mutant storm. It has nothing to do with itch. So when we are discussing itch, it's atmokinesis, not kinesis. This as thesia means altered sensory response. That means one uh, sensation that usually leads to, let's say, hot or cold sensation is actually causing itching, not hot and cold. So the sensation changes. Okay, algokinesis. Algo means pain and kinesis means itching. Okay, so pain causing itching or itching causing pain, it is mostly seen in atopic dermatitis. Central sensitization. Central sensitization means the neurons which are acting on the spinal or the brain level or the CNS level, they are very sensitized to receptors and mediators. So even a little bit of receptor or mediators is causing a lot of itch. So the mediator is only small, mediator is small, but the itch it causes or itch which is perceived is a lot. So that is known as central sensitization. This concept will be important in the part two of the video when we'll discuss about the itch scratch cycle. Okay, let's move forward. So remember, these are very two good quotes that I came across. So that I, I thought I'll include them in the video. That happiness is to have a scratch for every itch. 
so everybody uh, see, thinks that uh, whenever you have itching take uh, take uh, fexofenadine take citrazine everything is okay no it is very complex and when you understand the physiology of itch you will be able to better control it in your patients and in the next part of the video the part 2 of the video we'll discuss more about the clinical aspects what all disorders cause itch and how to treat the itching cause in particular disorders the other quote is scratching of one scratching is one of the nature's sweetest pleasure and nearest at hand is the easily available pleasure and you can thank your striatum and substantia nigra for that lovely lovely reward that we get on scratching okay substantia nigra for the good amount of serotonin and dopamine so these are responsible for the sweetest pleasure nearest at hand so these are some articles for further reading i would recommend that you read physiology and pathophysiology of h very good article it will tell you a lot about the physiology and you should read the bolonia chapter if you want to read one chapter from one textbook read bolonia chapter chapter number 5 cutaneous neurophysiology and if you still have time read the fitzpatrick chapter chapter 21 neurobiology of the skin very good written chapters so with that we have finished this week's discussion on the physiology of h i hope i have made myself clear how the h travels from skin to brain it's a very complicated mechanism complicated process and many of the times we regard the itch pathway as very simple pathway patient comes to you uh, in the it complain they complain of itching and you give antihistamine you keep on loading antihistamine you have reached the four time dose it is not responding you have no idea what to do you start giving sedative you start going get sedating the patient that happens when you don't know how itch is being transmitted when you understand the process of the transmission of the itch signal you can better control it okay i had uh, uh, i i now have a somewhat of a good understanding of the itch pathway because i made this video during my residency even i was unclear about a lot of aspects but uh, since i have made this video and because of this video i had to read a lot of articles and read a lot of chapters and now the understanding is a bit clearer on what actually happens in when a normal uh, itch pathway is activated causing to scratch in the part 2 video we'll discuss about the clinical aspects of pruritus we'll discuss senile pruritus uremic pruritus psychogenic pruritus its scratch cycle so make sure that after watching part 1 you go and see the part 2 of the video i will try to record it and release both the videos on the same day so that you don't have to wait one more week go and see the part 2 video after this or take a break in between if you want and uh, when you have seen the part 2 come back and see part 1 again you will have a better understanding of what all are, what all is happening when itch is being discussed in the setting of different skin disorders in the meantime if you have any questions you can email me directly on my email id or you can write your doubts suggestions or any kind of queries uh, related to itch anything that i have said in the video or any newer topics you want me to cover uh, i know i cannot cover all the topics whenever people suggest them but uh, i want to follow a regular sequential uploading schedule so that a kind of understanding and a good web of correlation develops in the brain since we had discussed uh, antihistamine for two weeks straight i thought this becomes a very good idea to discuss to writers so that we can further go and understand much more about the simple yet complex sensation of itching so that being said adios goodbye thank you so much for watching keep on watching other videos and i'll see you again in part 2 of this video the clinical aspect of pruritus bye bye